Hi, I'm Bill Olson, and I was just looking through the co table of contents of these two books that I just got. I told you about them the last time when I played the Michael Chos Chosodowski, uh clip on the globalization of war. Well, yeah, this is the book, The Globalization of War, America's Long, Long War Against Humanity. America's Long War Against Humanity. Table of Contents is a genuine history book of the world. This is a book that goes with it, The Globalization of Poverty. Same thing. Man, if you ever wanted to get books that put it together for you, these are the ones. But now, um, this is the 50th anniversary of the Selma, Am Selma, Alabama, the famous march across the bridge. And all the politicians are trying to make as much pay dirt out of it as they can. They want to associate themselves with everything that might be considered good and disassociate themselves even though they are the system that we were fighting, and they still are the system that we're fighting, uh, they're trying to pretend that they're somehow with the people. Watch Obama and you'll get a good disgusting feel. Well, the last few weeks, maybe even up to six weeks, I've been threatening to play the, uh, <coughs> that, uh, it's, it goes very well with the civil rights theme, uh, that how guns made the civil rights movement possible. And the, there's an author being interviewed who wrote a book called uh, this, uh, what, anti, what was it, anti-violence, non-violence will get you killed, that's it, non-violence will get you killed. Anyway, this is going to take most of the show. This is really good. It's the counterbalance to all the propaganda you're seeing on there, on, on the regular TV. So we're going to start, this is three parts, I'll come back in, in between each one. Go ahead and... Welcome to The Real News. I'm Eddie Conway. 45 years ago, as a member of the Black Panther Party, I thought that the Civil Rights Movement, even though I knew it was a, a realistic tactic to uh, organize in the South, I thought it was foolish and suicidal, and I couldn't understand how people could let uh, uh, police beat them in the head, sick uh, police dogs on them, uh, hose them down with water hose. And it was just until recently that a new book came out that points to the fact that those, some of those movements were actually protected with guns. And today, joining me in the studio is the author of This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. Please join me in welcoming uh, Charlie Cobb. Thank you for having me. In 1962, Charlie Cobb left Howard University and worked as the fuel secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the Mississippi Delta. Cobb is a senior writer for AllAfrican.com. He is the co-author of Racial Equations with civil rights organizer and educator Robert P. Moses. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, why you uh, left Howard University, where you was obviously going to get a degree, and went down to Mississippi. There, there are various pieces to that story that I'll try and bring together. Firstly, there's the generational story, meaning my generation of black young people at that time, in the beginning of the decade of the 60s. The sit-in movement. Mm -hmm. You know, we were all captured by the sit-in movement, even if we didn't participate in sit-ins. Uh, you're looking at people your own age challenging white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And remember, back in those days, uh, Washington, D.C. itself had only recently begun to desegregate. Washington doesn't begin to desegregate until the middle 1950s. Mm -hmm. And places like Baltimore or Maryland, the Eastern Shore, Virginia, that's all segregated. So as a Howard University student, I became involved with the sit-in movement, partly because I felt compelled, for lack of a better word, to join people of my own age mm -hmm. who were challenging white supremacy, and partly because my own family background 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I come from a family that's always been actively involved with civil rights and civil rights struggle or freedom struggle, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, in various kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So as my mother said to me when the first time I got arrested that she just wasn't surprised <laughs> that I was involved in that in such a movement. So you're saying you were in your second year at that time at Howard. I was hadn't even begun my second you're year. Skipping? I had yeah. finished my first year. And so you just trapped completely out. out, out I of stayed. College. Yeah, I did. I yeah. dropped out. I, I I thought and and that's where most of the SNCC and core people felt who were doing what we were doing in different mm -hmm. parts of the South mm -hmm. that this kind of work was more important than pursuing uh, the degree that we had entered into college mm -hmm. to get. I mean, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which I was involved with, was entirely formed mm -hmm. by young people mm -hmm. who had left school after being involved in the sit-in movement, but wanting to do something more mm -hmm. than uh, get a cup of coffee or a hamburger or something at some white restaurant or lunch counter, the whole organization. And CORE itself, the Congress for Racial Equality, was changed by young people who did exactly the same thing and, and who left. And most of them were Southerners, I should say, not Northerners. Uh, this was in 1961 when I enrolled in Howard. Mm -hmm. So because I was involved in the movement, uh, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, invited me to a, a young people's workshop for civil rights in uh, Houston, Texas, and as perhaps only a young person could do, I decided to take advantage of the invitation and also the money that Cor gave me for a bus with bus ticket to mm -hmm. see the South. And mm -hmm. I bought this bus ticket: Washington D.C., Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, and on into Houston, Texas. You went the long way. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you took the bus in those mm -hmm. days. You mm -hmm. know, you didn't yeah. get on an airplane and mm -hmm. fly, or nobody I knew, let me mm -hmm. put it that way, mm -hmm. got on an airplane to fly anywhere. I had never been on, and I was 19 years old in 1961. Mm -hmm. So I took this bus trip. And I got off the bus in Jackson, Mississippi. And the reason I got off the bus in Jackson, Mississippi was because the students in Jackson were sitting in and protesting. Now, mm -hmm. for my generation, Mississippi was entirely defined in our thinking mm -hmm. by the murder of Emmett Till. Mm -hmm. As far as we were concerned, there was no worse place Mm -hmm. for a black place person on earth and perhaps in the entire universe mm -hmm. than Mississippi. That was okay. our thinking. And mm -hmm. I felt it's one kind of it's one thing for me to be sitting in in Maryland or Virginia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to be protesting and sitting in in Mississippi. So I wanted mm -hmm. to meet these people who were mm -hmm. saying maybe they had some kind of gene that yeah. made him different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I did. I got off the bus and made my way to their headquarters and introduced myself as a Howard University student. I'd been involved in the sit-ins and was on the way to Texas for this workshop. And one of these students, then a student at Tougaloo College, uh, who would later become the chair of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Lawrence Guiot, mm -hmm. Big guy. Okay. Got up off his seat when I said I was on the way to this work, and he kind of hovered over me in complete disdain. Mm -hmm. And he said, I still remember his words. He said, he says, you're going to Texas for a workshop on civil rights? What's the point of that when you're standing right here in Mississippi? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and okay. I kind of got the message. It was yeah. like, a, it was yeah. both a challenge yeah. and a demand. You know, mm -hmm. if you're serious, Charlie. Mm -hmm. you, you don't need to go off and chatter somewhere about mm -hmm. civil mm -hmm. rights. We're getting ready to do stuff here in Mississippi, and mm -hmm. why don't you just stay here? <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what I did. I stayed. I didn't realize that uh, uh, once you make that kind of decision, uh, you can't just then when the summer ends tell all the people you're working with, well, school's about to start. <laughs> mm -hmm. Goodbye. Good mm -hmm. luck. I'm mm -hmm. back to my classes. You're kind of there if you're serious. Mm -hmm you kind of have to stay. You have to like, see it through. Because in those, the South was murderous. I don't think people today understand at all how murderous these places were. For people to respond to you as to put their lives at risk. Mm -hmm. And their biggest fear was that you'd ask them to do something, they'd do it, 
and then you could do the one thing that they couldn't do, and that was leave. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And so mm -hmm. you know, you had you almost had to stay. If it, it, almost a matter of honor as well as obligation, you just can. so I stayed. I wound up staying for almost five years, mm -hmm. as it as it turned out. And as I tell people, you know, the big lesson in all of that, whether you look at my involvement with the sit-ins in D.C. and Maryland and Virginia, or whether you look at me staying in Mississippi, that what was going on is people my own age were challenging me to mm -hmm. do something. And you respond to those kind of challenges one of two ways. You walk away, or you accept the challenge, and you, whatever it is you're doing, sitting in or organizing in the Mississippi Delta, you. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me now, this, your book, this nonviolent stuff will get you, get killed. you killed. Uh, and I see you say, How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible. Why did you choose that particular title? Okay, first the title and then the subtitle. Mm -hmm. the, the, the quote, This nonviolent stuff will get you killed, comes from a farmer in Mississippi, a man named Hartman Turnbow, tough guy, mm -hmm. older, as many of the people who, who embraced us were. Uh, Mr. Turnbow was the president of his little local mm -hmm. NACP branch in Holmes County, mm -hmm. uh, Mississippi. But it, it, like a lot of those guys, they liked us because we were willing to directly challenge white supremacy and they were looking for the kind of energy mm -hmm. that we brought to the movement. They were frustrated at some levels because the national NACP, which they were a part of, was really reluctant to involve itself in the deep south. Mm -hmm. They felt that it was too violent, too difficult, and that you wouldn't get anything done, but you would cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these NACP leaders who wanted to do something, a lot of them were World War II veterans, uh, took us in, because they said to themselves, I think, let's use the energy Mm -hmm. of these mm -hmm. young people. Because they're the ones that put, for instance, voter registration on our table. We weren't thinking about it. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who said, uh, yeah, stay with us, but we want you to do this. Cause, and it, really, they were making the case for black power because they were saying, we have the numbers if we can get them registered to vote, and if we can get them registered to vote, we can get rid of these sheriffs, and we can get rid of these county boards of supervisors, and all these other people, you know, oppressing us from official structures of government. Mm -hmm. um, so Hartman Turma was one of them, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, met Martin Luther King in mm -hmm. 1964. Okay. And after the usual courtesies of introduction, Mr. Turnbull, who was never known to bite his tongue, mm. looked at Reverend King and said, Reverend King, I want to tell you, this nonviolent stuff ain't no good. It'll get you killed. Mm -hmm. Now, that was too long for a book title. So okay. all I did with okay. the title was, mm -hmm. <laughs> was compress it to mm -hmm. this nonviolent stuff will get you killed. Now, I say how guns made the civil rights movement possible for what should be obvious, because they kept us alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These guys, when Mr. Turnbow, the same Mr. Turnbow, when, when, when Knight Riders attacked his farmhouse, and, and this was in 1964 or 1965, I forget when, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he drove them away with his Winchester, and if rumor is true, killed one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we showed up the next day, Mr. Turnbow said, uh, first thing out of his mouth was, I wasn't being non-non-violent. I was just protecting my family. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <And> that, yeah. <laughs> this is the rural South. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Guns are part of everyday life. People use them for hunting, to put food on the table. People use them to keep varmints out of the gardens that they had rats and the like. I and they use them for self-defense, although I would put self-defense third. I would say putting food on the table, one. This is the rural South where people are poor. Okay. Uh, and uh, guns were as natural a part of the culture as dungarees, overalls, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, or straw hats. And, you know, I simply don't think 
that we would have gotten as far as we got, and we didn't go all the way for all that we did, if these guys hadn't kept us alive. And the easiest way to think of that, I tell people all the time, I said, all you have to do is think of black people in the South as human beings. And they're going to do what any human being would do when under assault, do the best they can to protect themselves, do the best they can to protect their family, do the best they can to protect their communities. And in this case, we were a part of their communities. And if they took us into their households, if they said, yes, we want to work with you, they felt there was no contradiction between saying they were a part of a nonviolent movement while they were cleaning their Winchesters or cleaning their shotguns mm -hmm. or putting a pistol on the night table in case mm -hmm. you wanted to use it to drive away. I mean, they just didn't, it was mm -hmm. no contradiction in this. They saw themselves as protecting the movement, and in fact, they did protect the movement. I just, mm -hmm. I tell people all the time there would have been more people killed in the South if it wasn't for groups like the Deacons for Defense and Justice or Robert Williams and his group in Monroe, North Carolina, mm -hmm. or all the individual farmers and the like who had the shotguns and the Winchesters and the 45s and the 38s mm -hmm. scattered around their houses. And the white people knew this. Mm -hmm. And if you look at murder in the South, you'll see, and I say this in the book, I mean, when it comes to guns, we're not talking about some kind of cowboy movie where, mm -hmm. where the good guys are at one end of some dusty southern street and the bad guys are at another end and they walk towards each other and whoever's fastest on the draw mm -hmm. <laughs> wins. Mm -hmm. When you see black people killed, two things you see with respect to guns. One, mm -hmm. when you see black people killed, it's almost always by ambush and not one-on-one okay. -on -one confrontation. And two, uh, it didn't take much gunfire to drive white supremacists away. As much as they claimed mm. to like white supremacy, be committed, mm. and they weren't prepared to die for it. Mm. Okay, you mentioned Robert Williams, and you mentioned the NAACP kind of like helping y'all to organize and encouraging y'all and to some degree protecting y'all. But I noticed that earlier, uh, Robert Williams, he was like the president of an NAACP chapter and he armed his chapter and they protected the community and it seemed to me that the NAACP abandoned him and uh, the effort for him to uh, maintain his uh, position in the NAACP because of the use of guns? Not so much because of the use of guns. The NAACP's relationship with, with Robert Williams is a fairly complex. I mean, you had tensions, different kinds of tensions. There was a tension between national priorities mm -hmm. and local priorities, and that existed in many instances across the South. What the NACP nationally wanted to do in New York didn't necessarily coincide with what a local NACP branch mm -hmm. wanted to do. They didn't like uh, Robert Williams's aggressiveness and and pushiness and some of this there's a almost a class distinction mm -hmm. that you have to make between a gruff militant guy from a small southern city and the New York sophisticates like Roy Wilkins or, mm -hmm. or Gloucester Current uh, and whatnot who would have preferred a more polite demeanor. Uh, what got Robert Williams expelled uh, from the, the NACP was language. Uh, mm. A black woman had been assaulted, a pregnant black woman, a woman mm -hmm. eight months pregnant, I forget her name, had been assaulted by a white man uh, and found not guilty. Although everybody knew that this white man had assaulted this black woman. And Robert Williams walked out of the courthouse furious. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, uh, we can no longer count on, on these courts to supply any kind of justice to black people. And I think we ought to start to try these guys ourselves on the spot and find them guilty. And, and the New York Times had this headline <laughs> that said, NAACP leader 
calls for, I forget, vigilante action, some headline like mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. So Roy Wilkins calls uh, Robert Williams to say, you can't speak like that. You, you know, mm -hmm, you're giving the mm -hmm, NHB. Mm -hmm. And Robert Williams, being the kind of guy he was, said, well, you can't tell me how to speak. I won't say what I think. And the trouble with you people in New York is you don't care about ordinary people. Like they had this back and mm -hmm. forth on the telephone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then finally, uh, they hang up on each other. Mm -hmm. And that same afternoon, Roy Wilkins expelled <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Robert Williams uh, mm -hmm. from the NACP. Mm -hmm. But he still remained in Monroe, North Carolina, because he had this other group, you know, Robert Williams organized. Uh, a branch of the National Rifle Association mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. in Monroe. It's called the Black Guards. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he was still in Monroe. Mm -hmm. Then there's some shooting that takes place, and I'm making a, a mm -hmm. you know, a story really <laughs> okay. compressed, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that ultimately he winds up having to flee the country until 1969. Mm -hmm. You could do a whole show on Robert Williams. Okay. And, uh, All right. I'm Eddie Conway. And I'm here with Charlie Cobbs, the author of This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. And we will return in the next segment, and we'll talk about okay, how... Okay, I, I wanted to come back right away, because we're going to go straight to the second clip. Um, this is great stuff. This, sometimes people who lived through that don't remember all these details. But you young kids, they're not teaching you anything now about the past. So pay attention to this. Here's... The second part. Uh, thank you for joining us again for this second part of the interview with Charles E. Cobb, the author of This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. In 1962, Charles E. Cobb left Howard University to work as a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the Mississippi Delta. He originated the Freedom School proposal that became a crucial part of the 1964 Mississippi Summer Project. A founding member of the National Association of Black Journalists, Cobb has reported for NPR, PBS, Frontline, National Geographic, and the WHUR radio in Washington, D.C. Cobbs is a senior writer for AllAfrican.com, he is the co-author of Radical Equations with civil rights organizer and educator Robert P. Moses. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Thank you for having me here. You know, when we, when we last talked, we were talking about uh, the NAACP uh, kind of like supporting uh, your organizing efforts and so on, and you had mentioned Robert Williams, and uh, and so you told me a little bit about Robert Williams, and I'm wondering, you said, this book here is how guns made the civil rights movement possible, but as I was reading, I see that you also says that the story is much more than guns. It's about community organizing. What did you mean? I mean just that. Uh, guns... Firstly, and to give you the shortest answer, uh, guns kept us alive, mm -hmm. which meant the guns helped enable us to organize at the grassroots in local communities across the Black Belt South. I think the missed point, the missed lesson of the Southern movement is that more than a movement of mass protests in public spaces led by charismatic leaders, mm -hmm. what really defines the movement of the South, certainly in the 1960s, and I would argue going all the way back to the days of slavery and slave revolts, mm -hmm. is grassroots organizing in rural communities. If you think about it, mm -hmm. slaves were not organizing protest marches on the auction blocks. Okay. Slaves okay. were not having sit-ins at the plantation manor dining room table, seeking a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. What were they doing? They were organizing something, a revolt, mm -hmm. the ways and means of escape, the ways and means of survival, mm -hmm. sabotage, assassination. The organizing tradition is a deep tradition in the black community. And what you're looking at in the 1960s is just a manifestation 
of this old organizing tradition in rural communities of the South. That's what we were doing. This is the influence of Ella Baker when it comes to SNCC. Uh, she's the one that pushed us, mm -hmm. that great lady of social change in the 20th century, into grassroots community organ. And that's the story that needs to be told. Guns fit into this story in the sense that in these local communities in the rural South, guns were simply a part of the culture. And people were going to use them to protect us to protect themselves or to put food on the table or mm -hmm. for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. But they fit as instruments, as weapons, uh, inside the story of community organizing. And that's, uh, excuse, that is what I'm trying to push forward Mm -hmm. in this book. I mean, you have, and these are ordinary people. These are not the Martin Luther Kings. These are not the Andy Youngs. These are not the Roy Wilkinses. These are maids and cooks and sharecroppers and small mm -hmm. farmers and mechanics and entrepreneurs and ordinary people. Uh, they're the ones that form the backbone of the movement. They're the ones that kept us alive with their guns, and they're the ones uh, that embraced us as we entered into these communities in an attempt to assist them in efforts at organizing the overthrow of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Now, I heard you mention Ella Baker's name, and uh, when you think of the Civil Rights Movement, you think of Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, if you think of a woman, you think of uh, Rosa Parks. Who uh, is this Ella Baker? Ella Baker, and I may be prejudiced here, I mean, uh, she is one of the great figures of 20th century social change. In 1940s, she was the um, uh, director of branches for the NACP. So when, if you think about all those NACP branches that existed in the South, when we showed up in the 1960s, they were, in many instances, organized by Miss Baker. Uh, Martin Luther King's organization in 1950, when it was organized in 1957 or 58, Miss mm -hmm. Baker was the one. You're talking about the Southern Christian Leadership, Leadership Conference. Okay. SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. That was organized by Ella Baker. Mm -hmm. And she became its first temporary executive director. She was temporary executive director because she was a woman. And these preachers were uncomfortable with women mm -hmm. in leadership uh, positions. So you don't see a real official uh, executive director until Wyatt T. Walker becomes, uh, replaces Miss Baker as mm -hmm. the temper, as executive director. And she was the one, when the sit-ins erupted, who recognized the value and importance of all of this student explosion coming off the campuses of historically black colleges and universities. And she got $800 from Martin Luther King to bring the students together at her alma mater, Shaw College then, Shaw University now. Mm -hmm. And out of that meeting in April of 1960 emerged SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinator. Now Martin King gave Miss Baker the money. She was Miss Baker to us mm -hmm. because when she pulled this conference together, she was 57 years old. And, okay. and we okay. were 19 and 20 years mm -hmm. old. So she was going to be Miss Baker. Mm -hmm. uh, and Martin Luther King wanted a student wing to mm -hmm. his organization, and he saw the students becoming a part of it. Ms. Baker was the one going, telling the students, well, maybe you need to think about forming your own organization. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's how SNCC kind of emerged in mm -hmm. 1960. And Ms. Baker was the one who really said, if you want to have change, if you want to see change, then organize from the bottom up not the top down. Mm -hmm. her, her more famous sentence in SNCC's mm -hmm. uh, existence is, strong people don't need strong leaders. Okay. Pay attention to the grassroots mm -hmm. and you will find that leadership will emerge from the movement that emerges. This is Fannie Lou Hamer's story. Mm -hmm. This is Hartman Turnbow's story uh, from whom I got the title of this book. Mm -hmm. She was truly a great woman, and I'd have to say that virtually all of us in SNCC anyway could 
lay claim to being her political children. Um, I'm just uh, curious now, if, from what you're saying, it, it seems that she's responsible for the set-in movement? No, the sit-in movement erupted so pretty much spontaneously in 1960. There had been other sit-ins before. Mm -hmm. The sit-in movement emerged as February 1, 1960, when four students mm -hmm. from A&T sit in at the Woolworth. It catches on and it spreads like wildfire fire across the South, so that by the 1st of April, mm -hmm. two months later, uh, you have had sit-ins in about 80 southern cities involving thousands of students. Miss Baker, who then was working for SCLC, recognized mm -hmm. that this movement represented an important explosion of student political energy. Mm -hmm. But she also knew that the students didn't know each other. We at Howard didn't know the students at North Carolina mm -hmm. A&T. Mm -hmm. The students at North Carolina A&T didn't know the students at South Carolina State mm -hmm. or the students at Fisk. What Miss Baker recognized was that the students need to meet each other mm -hmm. and have a conversation with each other. So she got the money from Martin Luther King to bring the students together. Mm -hmm. And so the Nashville students could meet the South Carolina State students and the Fisk students could meet the A&T students. That was Ms. Baker's great insight that these students need to talk to one another and maybe need to think about forming their own organization and need to think about what their mission should be as a group of students. And where she used her influence was simply to say, if you do come together to mm -hmm. do some work, think about organizing from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. as opposed to the top down, because the tradition in 20th century civil rights struggle was from the top down, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, so Martin Luther King was the leader of SCLC, and his people, he and his people came in to these communities to tell them how to struggle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to follow him. Same thing for the NAACP. Ms. Baker presented a different kind of approach, you know, mm -hmm. listen to the people on the plantations, mm -hmm. listen to the small farmers, listen to the maids and the cooks and the sharecroppers, listen to the mechanics, listen to the cooks. That's what she's telling us. Mm -hmm. And you will learn something. First, you will learn what people really want. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Secondly, you will learn who the real leaders of the community are, because they're not in New York, and they're not in Atlanta, mm -hmm. in these kinds of places. They're down on the ground. You listen to these people, and you will find out who they are. And thirdly, she said, if you do this, you will also discover that there's leadership waiting to emerge. And when you involve yourself in these communities, these people will make their way to you. And this is the real force for change. I mean, that's, in a nutshell, what Ms. Baker represented in relationship to SNCC, certainly. Mm -hmm. Well, when, at, at what point did guns come into play guns in were terms always, of protecting? Guns were always at play. I mean, it wasn't as if the guns appeared because SNCC, guns had been used by black people mm -hmm. going all the way back to the days of Reconstruction when they had to fend off the Ku Klux Klan, the Knights of the White Camellia, the Pale Face Brotherhood. There were all these organizations mm -hmm. 100 years before we were involved. Mm -hmm. And black people had been using guns. And the reason they were able to use guns in Reconstruction was because so many black people had been a part of the Union Army. Mm -hmm. And they came back home with their guns. Mm -hmm. And they used them to protect their farms and their families, just the way they used them in the 1960s. So when we show up, uh, in 19, I show up in, for instance, in Ruleville, Mississippi in 1962, the man I'm staying with, Joe McDonald, he uh, has a gun in the corner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't have to tell him to go get a gun. <laughs> and he's going to use the gun the way he's always used the gun, mm -hmm. to hunt, to keep the varmints out of the garden, and to protect himself and those he cares about. And when I'm living in his house, I'm one of the people he cares about. And he's going to protect me. I don't have to organize him to do that. I don't have to tell him to do that. He's going to do it because he's just a normal human being. 
the Deacons for Defense and Justice in Louisiana emerged to protect nonviolent core workers. Core didn't have to organize it. Mm -hmm. These deacons, and they call themselves from deacons, I think, just to cloud the issue of what they were about. Uh, <laughs> the mm -hmm. deacons, or basically the deacons' attitude was, we're not going to let white people kill these nonviolent people. We're not nonviolent, and we're not going to let the white people kill them. Mm -hmm. If they try and kill them, we'll try and kill the white people. That's mm -hmm. the way they when, when did they emerge, though? Was 1964. It? Okay, and before that, though, with all the uh, people, freedom rides in the in the buses, the attacks where uh, people got off the, uh, yeah. the interstate buses and got beaten, brutalized. But look at it. Was there people there with guns? With guns? Yeah, but and, you, and 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 I guess my question is, how could they stand around and watch that level of brutality? Well, it depends on. They didn't always stand around one and watch that level of brutality, mm -hmm. but. You have to make, I think, and I, and I go into it in much more detail in the book than I can sitting at this table. Mm -hmm. I make a distinction in terms of movement struggle. There is the struggle, there is the protest movement, mm -hmm. largely centered in cities. Okay. And if you're sitting in at a lunch counter, you can say, yes, I'll take all this crap from white people. That's a tactical decision, not a philosophical decision. You can say, I'll take it for the greater good, the mission. Mm -hmm. I'll win sympathy. Who, I mean, if you see a white mob surrounding, you know, some college student trying to read books at the lunch counter mm -hmm. and, and trying to get, sir, how can you not feel sympathetic to them? So that's a tactical decision you make. And if you're strong enough, you take the mm -hmm. punishment. That's your mm -hmm. choice. Or if you're not, you say, I can't do that. And there were a lot of students who said, no, man, I can't do that. If the white people attack me, I'm going to crack their jaw. But, uh, that's, that's largely an urban phenomenon. Then there's a practical aspect. If you are sitting in at a Woolworth lunch counter and you're surrounded by, say, 50 people beating up on you, What's the best thing to do? I suppose you could pull out a pistol if you had one, but really, as a practical matter, the best thing for you to do, and this is sheer practicality, is to keep yourself from getting seriously hurt or to prevent somebody else from getting seriously hurt. And we had techniques that we use to do that. But we made the choice. We'll accept the violence, or not accept. We made no case for nonviolence as a way of life, as Martin Luther King did, or Bayard Rustin did. We just said, as a tactic, it seems to work. It wins sympathy, and a lot of places in the South in 1960 caved in to these protests. As another practical matter, even if you're not sitting in and you have a gun watching it, how do you use a gun in a kind of melee that you have, say, at the Birmingham bus station when the Freedom Riders rolled in? Or in Montgomery, Alabama, when, where everybody's all jumbled up together? I mean, think about it. It's, it's sort of like the kind of shooting that goes on today in too many inner cities. These guys drive through, they fire their guns, and anybody can get hit, often young children. So there are practical concerns about when to use the gun. To go to the bring people to the county courthouse with guns is, in rural areas, is to say, well, you're launching an armed attack. Mm -hmm. As a practical matter, that's not going to work. Okay, we're going we're gonna to come back. We're going to have another segment. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me here. And thank you for joining The Real News. We will come back in the next segment and explore what happened to the gains that were made in the civil rights struggle. Okay, and man, this is, this is really good. This is stuff that you will not learn in school today. You're, you're probably unlikely to learn it in college today. It, uh, I'm too disconnected to really confirm that, but maybe one of our viewers will write me. Okay, this is part three, here we go. Welcome back to The Real News. I'm Eddie Conway, and I'm here having a discussion with Charlie Cobb, the author of This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. And so far, we have been 
talking about uh, conditions in the South. Charlie Cobb left Howard University to work as a field secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the Mississippi Delta. He originated the Freedom School proposal that became a crucial part of the Mississippi Summer Program. Uh, a founding member of the National Association of Black Journalists, Cobb has reported for NPR, PBS, Frontline, the National Geographics, and HUR radio station in Washington, D.C. Cobb is a senior writer for the AllAfrican.com. He is the co-author of Radical Equations with civil rights organizer and educator Robert P. Moses. Welcome back, uh, Mr. Cobbs. I'm happy to be back. All right. Well, Charlie, when we left, we were talking about organizing and whatnot. And one of the things that I noticed in your book is you were talking about uh, the uh, anti-poverty programs uh, and how it basically just took the wind out of the sail of the civil rights movement. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, yeah, I think um, with the passage of, there were a lot of things that caused the movement to be in a state of flux. The mm -hmm. passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the emergence of poverty programs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all of which acted, we uh, didn't know enough, I think, mm -hmm. as young people to, to really know how to effectively respond to these uh, pressures. We were under a lot of pressure as an organization, say as SNCC, because a lot of people thought we were too radical. So, mm -hmm. so was, there was this whole conversation going on in Washington, D.C., and New York about how do you undermine SNCC's influence mm -hmm. in the South. And SNCC itself was struggling mm -hmm. with w what direction to go on. This is really boils down to the question of what do you do with success? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think about it. We started out as student activists trying to desegregate restaurants, and we won. Mm -hmm. We started out as student organizers fighting for the right to vote, and we won okay. by 1965. We could also see that being able to get a hamburger at a restaurant or being able to cast a ballot at the county courthouse didn't solve the enormous problems that we were looking at in the black community. It certainly didn't scratch the surface of the kind of problems you saw in the North. So what do you do? now that you've won some things. We were having this argument among ourselves mm -hmm. at the same time that very powerful forces were trying to blunt our influence in the South, or what they felt was our influence. Uh, and we didn't have the skills, I think, speaking honestly, to meet that challenge. I mean, you know, we as organizers mobilize communities and peoples to work on sometimes full time with us for no money. Mm. Now, here comes a poverty program in, say, a place like the Mississippi Delta, which is plantation con country, and most of the black people living in it are sharecroppers. And that poverty program says, well, work for us. Mm -hmm. And we'll pay you $30 a week. Well, how do, you <laughs> how do you compete with that? What kind of language mm -hmm. do you have that can tell somebody who's been making, say, as a sharecropper, anywhere from $1 to $3 a day, <laughs> now being offered $30 a week? You know, stick with us, and somewhere in the future, things will get better. We didn't have, and I'm speaking very honestly here, the skills, the ways and means to grapple with that. And then you had things like COINTELPRO and all kinds of things, you know, acting systematically and powerfully and deliberately against uh, the movement, uh, particularly the movement as, as it uh, uh, came to some conclusions, conclusions about some things that powerful people thought were too radical, like 
our opposition as an organization, SNCC, to the war in Vietnam, you know, or efforts to engage in labor organizing. You know, we, people forget, for instance, when Stokely Carmichael shouts out black power in 1966, he was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Young. Mm -hmm. You know, most of us hadn't reached the age of 25 <laughs> by the time the 1964 Civil Rights Act mm -hmm. was passed. So there was a lot we didn't know. Mm -hmm. Particularly when it came down, we're no longer really just in combat, say, with the Ku Klux Klan mm -hmm. or some group like that, the Association for the Preservation of the White Race, which thought the Ku Klux Klan was too liberal. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we're up against much more powerful mm -hmm. forces. And uh, I think, and if we had a table full of SNCC people, you could get a fierce argument going about this. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, we didn't have the skills. Mm. But do you think? The, the, just the concept of black power and black empowerment was kind of like what brought all of that attention? No. No. Black power. Mm -hmm. look, the whole reason we were involved in voter registration going all the way back to 1961 now is because all these local people in the South, particularly, and that's what they wanted. They're mm -hmm. the ones who put black power on the table. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do you think they wanted us to help them get people registered to vote, to have the power mm -hmm. to basically effect, to use a phrase that uh, mm -hmm. came out in an entirely different context, basically they wanted us to help them effect regime change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they wanted but us to do. But I'm talking about from the other side, not from what the black people wanted in the South on the ground, but the, the powers to be the reaction to black power and the drive I to kind of like yeah. change the uh, conditions in terms of uh, uh, economics and so on. I think a larger fear was, mm -hmm. was at play here than, than you get from reaction to the simple phrase black power. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what people in power recognized by the mid-1960s that something far more radical was emerging mm -hmm. from the Southern Freedom Movement. Ideas about governance, mm -hmm. ideas about economic arrangements, ideas about empowerment. The classic example of this is uh, during the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party challenge to the all-white delegation and Hubert Humphrey uh, and, and, and they picked in an effort to blunt that challenge two people from the MFDP who would be allowed. What's that? The Mississippi what? Freedom Democratic Party. Okay. Uh, they picked two people. Ed King, a white chaplain from Tougaloo College, and Aaron Henry, the state president of the NACP, and they basically told, well, we'll see these two. Mm -hmm. uh, when Ed King, who was white, suggested to Hubert Humphrey that instead of him, maybe they ought to think about uh, involving Mrs. Hamer. Hubert Humphrey's reaction was, the president is not going to let that illiterate woman speak mm -hmm. at this convention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what you see there is a fear of ordinary people mm -hmm. engaging the political process. When Stokely Carmichael shouts out black power, what they don't like about the phrase black power, after all, Richard Wright had used the black power, black power as the title of his book on, on Ghanaian independence years before. Mm -hmm. Adam Clayton Powell, the New York congressman, had called for black power months before Stokely mm -hmm. uh, shouted out uh, black power. So you say, well, what are they afraid of? They're afraid that what SNCC and other civil rights organizations are talking about is an expansion of participation in the political process in a way that directly threatens their power, their ability to mm -hmm. set the agenda for the country, their ability to rule. I mean, I think that's the fear that they had, and that fear was born before Stokely Carmichael mm -hmm. shouted out 
black power. There's always been this issue in this country as who has a voice in the political process. And in particular, who has a de deciding voice in the political process. Their fear of SNCC, their fear of grassroots organizing was that it suggested a way for people they wanted to keep out of the political process mm. coming into the political process. And when I say coming in, I mean coming in in a way that they can make meaningful decisions mm -hmm. and have meaningful influence you know, over the direction of a county, a state, mm. or the country itself. That fear is still with us, which is what is all behind the current efforts at voter suppression today, for mm -hmm. instance. That mm -hmm. fear is still mm -hmm. with, and they will use whatever devices they can, whether it's a poverty program or whether it's new law in mm -hmm. state legislatures. Mm -hmm. Or locking up, uh, or locking up uh, the population so that they could lose their rights to vote. Yeah, in felony the, convictions to, to a large uh, degree. Yeah, yeah. I mean there, there are all kinds of devices, mm -hmm. and they've been used mm -hmm. really since the founding of the country. You think about it, when the country was founded, you had to have property to vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let me just go back for a minute, though. The, it seemed like SNCC changed its name at some point. What was that yeah, about? Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't involved in those meetings. Okay. It changed its name from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to the Student National Coordinating Committee. And as I, re as I heard about it, I believe it was Jim Foreman, mm -hmm. who, was, who had been the executive director of SNCC but no longer was. I believe it was Jim Foreman who suggested that name. It was SNCC backing away from the word nonviolence wow. in its title. I think they felt that it wasn't relevant anymore. I mean, and really... SNCC really, it really wasn't mm -hmm. relevant. I didn't feel as strongly about that as some people did. It's like saying the NAACP should change its name from the National Association of Colored People to the National Association of Afro-American People. I suppose you could do that. But, you know, I'm sentimental. Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's fine. And I, I felt mm -hmm. the same way about SNCC, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Nonviolence doesn't function with SNCC in 1968, or whenever that name change mm -hmm. occurred. Mm -hmm. Nonviolence doesn't function with SNCC in 1968 the way it did in 1960. But I, you know, give in to my sentimental nature mm -hmm. on, on these mm -hmm. things. And mm -hmm. so I was perfectly content with nonviolent court, but mm -hmm. other people weren't. And they, mm -hmm. in a way, so they mm -hmm. picked national. Mm -hmm. And that's all that was. <laughs> well, I, I notice in your book you're, you're advocating that we need to move back to the nonviolent position again in terms of the violence that we find in our community. I think there should be a conversation about nonviolence, you know, that mm -hmm. may, be more, may be relevant again. You look at, and here I'm in many ways talking about cities. Mm -hmm. you, you, you look at Indianapolis, or, or Baltimore for that matter, or, mm -hmm. or Detroit, or Chicago, you look at this violence. Uh, the, uh, last month, um, this nine-year-old boy was killed mm -hmm. by two gangbangers, mm -hmm. actually four gangbangers. They were moving around this neighborhood uh, looking for rival gang members to shoot. Mm -hmm. They thought this nine-year-old boy's boy told uh, their rival gang members that they were looking for them. So they assassinated this nine-year-old boy, shot him in the head and chest, killed mm -hmm. him. You look at that and you kind of say, is it possible to have a conversation in these communities that attacks this kind of violence? You know, how is it that uh, and I put this in the book, mm -hmm. I mean, clearly nonviolent struggle had an impact in the South. I mean, mm -hmm. an important aspect, important fact is that people engaged in nonviolent protest effected change. Mm -hmm. I think we can prove that. So how is it that the idea of nonviolence has been lost? Mm -hmm. There's no conversation about nonviolence that's meaningful, 
really. I could point to individuals mm -hmm. who I think have, Diane Nash maintains a conversation about that, Bernard Lafayette, uh, Reverend James Lawson, names that may not be known to many viewers who, who were important to the 1960s movement and are still around. Mm -hmm. uh, but really, it's not a part of the political dialogue mm -hmm. in the black, and the great lesson of the South, in my view, in the final analysis is as much as the movement in the South challenged white supremacy, more importantly, what the movement did and involved was black people challenging other black people. Mm -hmm. And that is the question that's in front of us today when we look at this violence mm -hmm. in these inner cities what black people are going to challenge what black people <laughs> to tackle this question. Uh, that's more important to me than asking white people for stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, answer that. <laughs> answer your own question. Well, I think the people who are committed to nonviolence as a way of life, we talk mm -hmm. ought to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. they ought to enter these. How do you embed yourself in a violence-ridden community? How mm -hmm. does, let's name names, how does Jesse Jackson or Martin Luther King III, or uh, uh, Al Sharpton, who appear in some places, like they did in Ferguson, mm -hmm. to protest the murder that took place there. How, since they have organizations, how would they embed themselves in murderous inner city communities where a parent sending their kid to the corner store is more worried about the kid getting hit by a stray bullet than by a cop's bullet. How do you tackle that? How do you organize that against that? What's the language that you need? Can you embed yourself in these communities the way we did in the South 50 years ago or 45 years ago? I think these questions need to be grappled with. Are there lessons from the Southern experience mm -hmm. that might be applicable to these kinds of problems? I mean, you know, I think that's on us. Okay, we're running out of time there. We only had a few seconds left on that video. Um, but interesting news before we go. Niels Herrett, the Danish chemistry professor who uh, was one of the co-writers of the uh, Bentham Journal uh, paper on uh, what energetic materials, in other words, nanothermite found in the uh, World Trade Center dust. Well, a Danish newspaper referred to Niels Herrett as a crackpot who, you know, you might as well just invite somebody, some crackpot like Niels Herrett, uh, just as well as a, a uh, Holocaust denier or something like that. Anyway, uh, real bad to, to call a scientist something like that. So he is taking them to court with money that the 9-11 movement has raised. He's going to get to present 9-11 evidence for the first time in court to prove he's not a crackpot. This might break things wide open. It's on the 12th next week. Check it out.